mal hermano dice un día ay hermanita del corazón ya tu hermosura me tiene loco y tu marido quiero ser yo la pobre joven quedó azorada en el instante le contestó mejor prefiero morir mil veces antes que logres manchar mi el mal hermano sacó el revólver en el instante le disparó dándole un tiro en los sentidos que todo el cráneo le destrozó ¡Túpale mi general! From Monterrey, Mexico, we traveled west across the state of Coahuila to the sleepy town of Parás de la Fuente. Parás is an oasis ringed with old vineyards and wineries. In 1968, it was chosen as the principal location for the Wild Bunch, which was why, in April 2004, we were finally heading there. Traveling with us was Sam Peckinpah's youngest daughter, Lupita. Raised in Mexico, she was on her own journey to discover the father she never really knew. Peckinpah chose Parás in part because of its direct connection to the film's historic heart, the Mexican Revolution. The town was the birthplace of Francisco Madero, the president who supported the rebel movement and served in 1910 as headquarters for Pancho Villa. Outside town, in a remote and deserted spot, is the Hacienda Cienega del Carmen, a centuries-old abandoned winery which became the Wild Bunch's most iconic setting the lair of General Mapache, Agua Verde. Here, in the remarkable ruined beauty of the Hacienda, it's impossible not to be moved by the overwhelming allure of the landscape and everything it suggests. We imagine the distant mariachi music, the barked commands of Mapache, and the film company at work. Above all, we imagine Sam Peckinpah, struggling to hone and refine what would become his masterpiece. We've all spent a lot of time thinking about Sam. We've written about him, made films about him, and at last, after years of talking and procrastinating, we agreed the time was right. We had to come and see it, feel it, for ourselves. It's really remarkable. I mean, I don't think I ever expected to get here, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I was so taken with what I saw all those years ago that it really changed the course of my life. I mean, I did 
I got into filmmaking because of this film. I mean, this really took me in a direction I never really anticipated going. And coming here, um, I have to say, makes me even more in awe of what Sam was capable of. I mean, he took what other people really couldn't see and he turned it into something extraordinary. Um, you know, it, there is a line in the film about it looks like more Mexico to me, at which point Angel says, you have no eyes. With in many ways, that's really Sam talking to the rest of the world. They're not seeing what he's seeing. And he takes um, a location which is extraordinary, has great possibilities, but what he does with it raises everything to a totally different level. Thirty-five years since I first saw this movie. It feels like, in some ways, the completion of a journey. Thirty-six years ago, on this very day, Sam and the crew moved into this hacienda, this abandoned hacienda, and started to shoot one of the most extraordinary sequences that's ever been filmed, the Battle of Bloody Porch. Bloody Porch, and it was Sam and Lucian and, and Cliff Coleman, the assistant director, and, and looking at it, and Sam just looking around, just really, he didn't have a clue what he was going to do at that point. He really didn't, which is good because I think when he creates on the spot, he gets his best stuff. But it was like, all right, let's everyone go outside, sit down, and uh, by the time we came back, he knew right there was going to be four cameras side by side. Uh, I believe it was, and let's go. And we just shot a master from one angle and moved it up and moved it up, kept moving the cameras across the porch, and they turned around and shot a reverse master three days later, coming back across. And our assistant director was so good, Cliff Coleman, that not any time did any extra stuntman were they off their mark, and it made it so easy to cut. They knew right where they were at every moment of time, every moment of choreography, every bullet it matched. The builders did not know the use to which their buildings would be put. And, you know, so far as we know, this was never any sort of religious site or anything like that. And yet, by the time you get to the end of that movie, you know, Sam has so managed to manipulate his themes, develop his themes, the way it's shot and so forth with those, you know, those beautiful arches, which are strictly utilitarian in purpose. They support the, the, the aqueduct there, but they just in, acquire this whole sort of super meaning uh, and I'm sure a lot of his ideas were focused the first time he saw he saw this location you know the way he did it. I mean, you've got the cages on the windows, the bars and the walls all around that just suggest the enclosed space. And you've got a few hundred Federale soldiers in their identical looking uniforms who are kind of like the ants. The kids are sitting around in the various windows. And of course, the wild bunch, the scorpions that stand up. I started walking down these buildings and I rounded this corner right here and instantly like 
recognize that this is the spot where Ernest Borgnine was sitting whittling as he listened to Mapachi's drunken soldiers celebrating as they were dragging Angel around and uh, kids were riding his back. And, um, it is, it is, uh, this is to me the, probably the most powerful spot because this whole sequence is the most moving sequence to me in all of Sam Peckinpah's movies. You can see um, Ernest Borgnine as he's whittling that stick uh, self-loathing in every stroke of the blade. It's just, just so visceral. And then right to my right are the two rooms where Pike Bishop is with the prostitute, the young prostitute. And the Gorch brothers are in the other room arguing with their prostitute. As the baby cries in the corner, as he holds the empty bottle and you see the realization in his face of all the paths not taken, all the paths it's too late to take, of young girls like this that maybe he loved or almost loved or will never now love and the sense that he really is at the end and he has to do something. I love the lighting of it, I love the texture, I love the fact that the, a whole world of emotions plays out with no dialogue just on Holden, William Holden. And it's so strange when you just walk around the corner and here's a part of your imaginative life there. And they start walking actually along the bodega, which is not really close to the aqueduct. And, but they go around the corner, and Sam just perfectly cut it into them coming around the corner through the aqueduct. And you wouldn't, unless you'd been there, you wouldn't have known that that was in a slightly different location. Hidalgo Plaza, we're in Paris, this is where the uh, opening massacre takes place. Mm -hmm. Take us through it, they come down from that yeah. angle there. Well first, we are standing where? We are standing at the end of the street where the flashpoint takes place when the, the old man is shoved out of the bank and the bounty hunters we're start firing on We're on the balcony of the him. building where Robert Ryan and the bounty hunters are on the Yes, roof. and right here this balcony we're standing on was extended and one of the bounty hunters shoots. But in any event, right at the end of the street, to the left over here was where the temperance tent was. William Holden and the bunch come around that corner, just where that gray building is with the like triangular type pattern on it there. They come round the bend, past the temperance marchers, come walking down, dismount, help the old lady across the street, then walk back over, go into the railroad office, do their business in there. There's that shot past Robert Ryan where we're looking past this building where we're standing here as they go across. And you can tell just by looking at it how much they had to build out. Like, you can see that this is all raised over here. This whole side of the town is raised. 
because that's the topography of the land. So they brought in tons of dirt and sand to kind of equalize that out and make it look like a street that went straight up to the sidewalks there. I mean, it, it's, the work of the art directors is just amazing. I mean, they created a real border town. But I think that's true of the entire picture when we're down here and seeing these locations. I mean, you go out to Agua Verde, and again, the Hacienda, it's a wonderful 400-year-old winery and aqueduct and all of that. But it's just the beginning. I mean, Sam and his crew created a whole landscape out there in the fullest artistic sense of the word, and if I may say so, I think even metaphysical sense of the word. I mean, that whole town out there, as it were, lives, and yet when you walk out there, we can make it live because we know it, but you don't automatically see that. And anybody who knows the movie well could walk into this square and would not know that that movie was shot here. You know, other aspects of, of of just the, the sheer expertise that went on in this movie. You know, movies are always still about budgets, money, time, efficiency. And, you know, people talked about, often talk about Sam's profligacy, but the reality is that this was a magnificent example of really, really super efficient movie making. Yes, the picture went at least it doubled its original budget, but that was actually with the approval of the studio head at that time, Ken Hyman. He saw the footage Peckinpah was bringing in, and he knew this was something extraordinary. And when Feldman began to complain, Hyman said, just keep, let him keep going. Come on, you lazy bastard. <laughs> Just to uh, conclude the story, when they come out of the bank, they right. throw the bank teller out yes. in front of the Temperance Union there, and then well, the bunch coming around the crossfire yes. from the bounty hunters above us. Yeah. And uh, most of the action takes place right here where the, uh, yeah. where the carousel is. There's the pole where that, the one bunch member is hit and he sort of falls next to that pole. And right around there is where William Holden's horse raises up and he accidentally tramples the woman. In the middle there is where Matthew Peckinpah is standing yeah. with his arms wrapped around the little girl. Little girl, yes. Yeah. Um, and then they run back out that way, the same way they came. <laughs> Turn the bend, and there's the wagon where Buck is shot, is shot in the face. say I mean uh, it just is amazing it is a, it is actually an amazing experience yeah. to stand on the balcony of this building yeah. and know that the film that we've cared about all these yeah, years was shot right there He was a man who, was, um, who wasn't afraid to look at himself as honestly as he could and um, strip away the artifice. When I wrote about him, the first draft I did wasn't as clean as it needed to be, and I, made, and, and I gave it to him, and he hated it. And he wasn't afraid to tell me, you're not, you're not painting me as honestly as you can. Don't be afraid to look at what you may not like. There was a moment. Um, Churubusco Studios, where he took me outside while he was making, he was preparing to shoot Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. And he insisted we both take a piss on the walls of the studio as a statement, because he had just been told there was something he couldn't do and, and he needed to do. And then he said, 
don't worry, we're going to get this one done too. And I thought, you know, this is a guy who really does believe in who he is and what he can do. At the end of seeing that movie, I walked out thinking, if this is a movie, what have I been watching all my life? And it changed my life, like it changed most people's years today. We all got altered because of what Sam did in this movie. And the amazing thing is that for so many people, he's a forgotten man. What would I say to him? I don't know. I don't know what I would say to him if I were, if, you know. It, I thought about it when we came out here. I, I thought, it, you know, he never came back here. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been something to, to bring him back out here? To walk it all, you know, maybe if you could have done that in 1984 or 83. Honestly, I think he would have been, would have been an overwhelming emotional experience for him to come out here. Uh, I, I think it would be very difficult for him, and that, that's what I would envision. I think it would be an overwhelming, because this was it. This was the peak. This was when he put it all together on so many levels, and he knew that, and he knew when it was over. I think he knew when it was over. He had done, he had achieved, you know, his greatest film. Uno de los momentos más importantes de este viaje para mí fue la visita a la hacienda Ciénega del Carmen. Al estar ahí, pude literalmente transportarme a las escenas de la película de la pandilla salvaje. Pude claramente imaginarme y sentir la presencia de mi padre, ahí, sentado en su silla, dirigiendo a sus actores. Fue sin duda un momento muy especial. Fue el sueño más precioso que de pronto cobraba vida y se volvía realidad. Here we are at El Romoral, about 20 kilometers from the town of Paris, in the windy twilight of the day. And this, of course, was the setting for two major scenes in the film, the first of which is the return to Sykes' camp, where the bunch go to after the opening massacre and realize that they only have worthless steel rings and washers and not money. Silver rings. Silver rings, your butt! Them's washers! Damn! The second, of course, is the campfire scene where Pike will have his first flashback memory and will utter the immortal line, I wouldn't have it any other way. And with those beautiful mountain ranges behind us, we can imagine just what it was like in 1968 when that scene was shot. And after we've journeyed around Paris and its surrounding areas and seen many of the Wild Bunch locations, we wouldn't have it any other way either. <laughs>